So, how many of you actually did the personality test that I left you with at the end of last week? Well done, thank you. How many of you found that surprising? Or did it show you things about yourself that by and large you kind of knew? Hands up for those who found it confirmed their knowledge. So, okay, so the other people, what did it show you? Nothing useful or did it help you actually to understand a bit? Hands up if it helped you. Oh dear. Well, at least some people found it vaguely useful to sort of confirm their understanding of themselves, which is always kind of helpful. What I'm going to do today, oh, first of all, I should mention all of the videos now are available on that link, which is available for you. So you can now look at all of the videos of all of the lectures that I've given you so far this term. And this one will go up tomorrow fairly early. Uh, it just depends how quickly I can get it into YouTube. Sometimes YouTube is a bit busy, sometimes it works a treat. Um, this morning it worked very, very quickly. Last night, or yesterday afternoon, it didn't do anything at all. So hopefully it, this will be available to you middle of tomorrow morning. So you'll find it quite useful to go back over these and you'll have access to these for the rest of your life if you want to refer back to them. So that's where the videos are at that YouTube playlist. And you can see here what's actually at that point. But there's also other playlists in there so that you can actually get at next year's or second year and final year modules if you want to. And they're going to be replicated into the Computing at Derby playlists uh, when Dave Voorhis has managed to make the time to move, copy the links across into the, you might say, the more official computing playlists of our lectures. But today, we're going to look at this item, Skills for Employment. And it's based on something called SFIA, Sphere. And it's based around an initiative by the British Computer Society. And it's a really interesting presentation of how different types of technical and soft skills are used out in industry for various different types of subject area. And you'll see that, I'll take you through that uh, over the next three quarters of an hour. But what's also valuable, so you've got a list of, you might say, competencies or technical skills down the left-hand side of a matrix that they present. But across the top, they also provide you with an understanding of how those skills are being used by different types of roles within industry, from the person at the left-hand end, level one, who really is a sort of support technician who needs to be supervised pretty much most of the time, right through to level seven, which is where you're setting, uh, as a senior manager, setting policy, setting strategy, inspiring and leading your team. And I'm going to give you a picture as you go through those levels as to how you can use this over your next three or four years here at the University of Derby and in your placement year and then out into your... Do you think you'd like to have a conversation outside, folks? So this is going to help you build an understanding of your capabilities and also, and most importantly, to collect the evidence of how you have achieved that those various technical skills at the levels one through to level five, six, or seven. Some of you in, are going to be able to find evidence that in some modules, particularly in your final year, th level, third year, level six, that you are actually being able to set strategy. You're using, doing critical evaluation of a context, and with that, you are developing strategy. Those are the criteria we're using in some of the BSEIT and other modules and other programs to see how good you are. And you will be able to develop evidence 
that supports your claims when you apply for jobs against SOFIA criteria. Many IT-related companies or organ IT organizations in big companies and in small companies are using the SOFIA criteria both in terms of technical skills and the, the various levels one through seven as part of the requirements specification for you to apply for jobs. And when they do that, they're going to need evidence. That means I wrote this article, I wrote this assignment, and I developed a strategy, or I just did a competent piece of business analysis, which would be around about a level three or a level four. So I'm going to take you through that. I'm going to show you the links where you can go to Sophia, and you can sign up with a student for personal use. You can sign up to the Sophia framework, download all the criteria, and even use it for continuous professional development. You'll be able to use it to plan or to identify the skills that you've got, technical skills, and as you're developing year by year, module by module, you'll be able to say, ah, this module helps me get this and this and this skill at a technical level, and this or this level of capability from one to seven. You'll be able to use it as a gap analysis. I need these skills, I haven't got them, but I can see in a couple of, in a year's time, I'm gonna do this module, and it's gonna help me build these skill levels and capability levels. So you can do it from today onwards to help develop your understanding of what you like doing, what you need to be able to do, to be able to get those sorts of jobs that you really, really want. And then you can use it into the future. As you go through your placement year, part of your reflective thinking about what have I achieved this week or this month, and why did I achieve it? What went well and why, in a sort of potted version. And also to think about the things that didn't go quite as well as, you, as you'd planned. And then you have to think about why didn't it go as planned? Why wasn't I successful? What do I need to do to become successful? So this is what reflective thinking is about in terms of developing your skills as a student and ultimately as an employee. And there's many of these organizations that use Sophia for their job applications also use them for professional development to help you as an employee develop your skill set to become even better and even more valuable for your employee, or employer, sorry. So it's a really important uh, thing to start using. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through the columns and the rows so you can begin to understand how to apply it. I'm only looking in terms of skill levels at the very basic topic areas. In fact, they're broken out into about three more fine le detail levels in terms of the, skill, the technical skill areas. They've been working on this for quite a few years with industry. And they're now, we're looking, going to look at level, the Sophia 5 framework. They're currently <coughs> working on <coughs> Sophia 6, which has been out for con consultation for a while and will be implemented as a slight modification of the current framework I'm going to show you over the next few months, hopefully. I covered this slide as the introduction used by the IT industry itself and the IT departments within businesses. And we can use it to help, or if we pay the right fee, we can actually claim we're using the Sophia framework and we can do all sorts of things and give certification if we want to, we don't. We don't think it's necessary to do that, but we do encourage you to sign up individually. And then you can get the benefit for your own professional development your own use, uh, development as a student. It's called the Skills for an Information Age. And that is the link that you will be able to click on when you download that presentation, and it'll take you to Sophia. They're also 
doing some other work, both between Sophia and also both between the British Computer Society and an organization called tech, the Tech Partnerships. And they are providing occupational, uh, uh, national occupational skill frameworks. And again, these are quite valuable sets of uh, ideas that you can use to help identify the types of skills that you need for different types of jobs. Whether it's data analytics, more for the IT students, um, data management for the computer science, networks, um, forensics, data science around how we handle all the technical computing aspects that relate to big data analytics, also for IT and telecoms, uh, professionals, networks, security, forensics come in there, and then also for people who want to use IT. So lots of different frameworks here, and also that bottom link, which I probably mentioned in the induction uh, discussion, um, you can find these sort of profiles uh, of what sort of technical skills and what's, which soft skills you expect to develop at each level of uh, first year, second year, final year, um, kind, of, kind of valuable understanding of how we build the curricula for your programs here. So these provide you with a sets of questions that you can use to understand what sort of skills you need to develop and to what level. And then you can use particularly the SOFIA framework to help you understand understand what evidence you need to collect in order to be able to present a good job application with specific evidence that yes, you have got a level four or level five in this particular skill. Because that's what job applications are expected to deliver to the recruiting people when you fill in your uh, job application. Just to leave it without evidence, probably your job application will go straight into the ground out basket without consideration. Provide the evidence and they will say, ah, great, I can now go and interview that person and explore the claims, explore the evidence. And hopefully, for you guys, that means they will give you those jobs. Here's an interesting uh, link for those of you who want to get into the world of big data analytics, data science, the world of providing valuable insights based on all those huge amounts of data that companies have inside their organization and are now busy collecting from outside the organization. So have a look at that one, that will give you again different perspectives on the types of skills you might want to develop. So, on to Sophia. Skills for the information age. Two critical aspects. The technical skills and the levels of responsibilities are the sorts of jobs that you will be aspiring to get, get to over the next five or ten years of your career. A couple of direct links. There's a Wikipedia link there which gives you some information quite easily and quite quickly, <coughs> but only around the levels of responsibility. They used to have a rather nice extra section about the technical skills and, and the picture of the whole matrix of the skills at a fine level detail and across at the responsibilities. Due to copyright reasons, uh, they had to remove that. Uh, so, but you can get access to it directly through logging in or joining your uh, at Sophia, and it's very, very easy. You just give them an email address, use your uh, uni mail address to start with, perhaps, or you could use your personal email address, and then sign up, get a password, and then you'll get them to do it. There will be, if you follow it through the right way, no need to pay any money for a membership free because you're using it for your personal professional uh, usage. And that is free. Standard license. Going across the top of the matrix, seven columns. From following 
And if you look at some of the criteria at level one, it typically means that you know, you're, you're a technical support person who needs to be guided and directed and supported pretty much all of the time. Assist, apply, and I'll go through the formal definitions in a minute. Applying level three, that's kind of the junior business analyst type of level. Enabling, well, I would link that, broadly speaking, to you know, a, a reasonable level of a business analyst or a competent uh, senior programmer type of level, most likely. Don't need very much direction. And then you go through enabling, ensuring and advising those people who are now sort of supervisory level, who can begin to actually take, a, take a, um, ownership of much of what's going on. And then level six and seven are the more senior levels of management. Now, you might be surprised that some of you are going to be doing work up at level six or seven by the time before you leave here. But some of you will do that. That's absolutely certain. You will be doing critical evaluations of situations in particular contexts in order to create suitable strategies for an organisation. Some of you are going to achieve that. They've done, uh, your predecessors have done that. Uh, so a few people each year are achieving that quality of work. Some of the assessments we're beginning to use now in terms particularly of the soft skills in that two brain <coughs> picture from tech partnerships and SAS as I've shown you before now, some of those, the assessments using that approach will be able to demonstrate your ability to actually set strategy but more particularly to inspire. Deliver that <coughs> storytelling, that authority in your writing, and your presentation, which is going to inspire the people you're talking to or writing for to go and do something really different and really interesting. In terms of the left-hand side, the, the, the different rows, there are those six rows there of the, of the technical skills, you might say. Skills relating to strategy and architecture, Sophia defines a whole framework of skills relating to the changes that are necessary in order that we can use IT effectively, in order that our companies can become more efficient. It's called change management. It's something that is very slow and is very hard work. Many companies like to think that they can achieve good business change or change management in 18 months to 24 months. That's the length of time the project may last for. The reality is rather different. There was a very, very interesting case study written about by um, Jeffrey Walsham in a book called uh, IT, uh, what's it, IT in an Information Age or something like that which is based around a case study of IBM in the 1990s, when Lou Gerstner became chief executive and tried to change the way that IBM operated. Prior to him being there, IBM had the major technical areas, mainframes, software, databases, um, major products, and so on. And if you were a big organization, working or as a customer of IBM, you needed to know who your su supporter was in each of those various divisions. So you might end up with half a dozen account managers within IBM. And if things went wrong, it was you as a customer who had to work out where to go. And he said this was absolutely crazy. A customer should have a single point of contact. And so he put in place a huge change program in IBM in 1992-34, sometime around about there, with the intention that everybody would begin to understand what they needed to do to make this single point of contact work. 
so that that person in IBM, the single point of contact, knew the intricacies of IBM and could find the right person to help you, the customer who got a problem. What was very, very interesting in this study that Walsham uh, published back in 2001 was that it took nine years to get it begin to begin to work. At the end of the nine years, the study showed that only one part of IBM, IBM North America, really had taken to the changes, really understood them and were putting them into practice. All of the other areas, IBM, um, EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, South Asia Pacific, and, and South America, and so on, yeah, they, all the staff involved could pass the test with flying colors. They had it up here in the head, the intellectual knowledge of what was, they were supposed to be doing. But the problem was, they didn't believe it here, in their heart. They didn't really want to follow it. And when I was at Rolls-Royce Aerospace back in the sort of late 90s, and, uh, and 2000, the first part of 2000, with a couple of huge business pr process re-engineering projects that affected almost every single person in the company, the intention was that it, in 18 months, they would do the change management, that people would learn why and believe why they had to do the work differently, supported by SAP on the business side and so on. At the end of the project, 18, 24 months after it had started, uh, December 2000, and it should have been finished by Easter, 2000, so eight months later, or eight months late, the project, they looked to see what had happened and discovered that nobody believed in the change process. They didn't want to do it the way the system had been configured. <coughs> they didn't believe in the way that the uh, business process re-engineering that had gone into the SAP pro project was going to work because it was designed to break the informal connections, the informal networks, the way that up until then, if we had a problem, we went to the person in the right part of the organization we knew and trusted to help fix the problem. <coughs> because SAP had been configured into this modern thing called workflow. You just went through the steps and it kind of did itself. But nobody at the end of that two, two and a half year project believed that. They still wanted to use their informal networks. So change management is an incredibly important point. At the end of that project, at the end of December 2000, they decided they needed to appoint one of the most touchy-feely um, senior, senior management who was really great at understanding how people operated, how they worked, what enthused them, what made them work, to run another year, year and a half project to complete, as far as possible, this business change management project. So it's an incredibly important point that very, very rarely works because people want it to happen much more quickly than we, as people, are capable of changing. And if you look at what's going on in many, many areas, whether it's in all the things that live on here, all of the online stuff that's there supposedly to help us as citizens and so on, or as customers to do things quicker and better and with less hassle, often we don't believe it and want to go keep on with the old ways. Just an example, how many of you, when you go to a supermarket to check out, like to use, always use the self-checkout? How many of you like to go through the people's operated side? For those who put their hand up, that's about even Stephen. So about the same number like to go for the personal approach as opposed to the self-checkout. Okay, great. So that proof shows that so that shows you know that we kind of are slow to change. And there's something called the adoption curve. The early adopters through to the laggards, 
who really don't want to change very often. And we have to remember that that's very, very important. That we do have to recognize, yeah, there's some people who really want to start on new technology as soon as it appears. The people who decided to choose Betamax 25, 30 years ago with video recording, because it was technically better, except it was too expensive, and it was, didn't record as much on the tape and so on, but it was better quality. And eventually VHS won out. And if you look at things today, uh, while I was in, I think it was, I forget which of the airports I've been to in the last uh, few months, I was looking at my a little network analyzer to see, which showed me what sort of phones, mobile phones, were attached to the Wi-Fi in that airport. Almost all of them in that particular airport were Apple. There were two or three HTC, one or two Samsung, one or two Nokia, if that, but mostly Apple. Almost all iPhones. So we can see how things are working if we look at uh, our data we have around us. So business change, stunningly important and incredibly difficult to be successful at. Next topic, solution development and implementation. Well, all of you are looking at that sort of thing uh, with your programming one and two, <coughs> with group projects, uh, with databases next year, and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of technical skills in terms of problem identification, requirements analysis, and then delivering the new software and implementing it effectively. And at the end of the day, thinking about did we do it right, post-implementation audits, and so on. Lots of technical skills there. Service management, well, we've now implemented it. Now we need to keep it going. Keep it up. robust, secure, changing where necessary and appropriate, and basically meeting the client customer's needs. By customers, I'm talking about those who are using it. And there are various frameworks available, one of which is ITIL, and some of you may have come across ITIL. If you haven't, you probably will do, uh, but you can also go and have a look, at, look up in the, on the net what ITIL is all about. How to deliver services, how to maintain services. And then another very, very important area is this procurement one. In the old days, if you go back to when I first started, 30 odd years ago, maybe a bit more, 40 years ago in IT, in big organisation, you just had a big IT organisation who delivered everything to you, apart from you had to buy in your computing facilities, i.e. your mainframes and storage and your printers and your terminals and so on. And you had to choose the right software occasion to buy in a package, perhaps. But today, particularly as almost all small and medium-sized enterprises don't have a team to write their software, you are buying lots and lots of services. You're buying support services from a range of small companies up to big companies who will implement your network for you. In Derby, we have small organizations that you, some of you will probably go to for your placement year. 3XGP is an example, or another one is Orchid in Derby, and they provide total solutions to small, medium-sized organizations. Big organizations also do that. There's a lot of outsourcing. Uh, you can think of so many software as a service types of products out there that you just use in the, in the cloud. How many of you are using Office 365 through your student account? That's software as a service. Using your Unimail account, that is software as a service. It just sits up there somewhere, someone looks after it, and in your Unimail uh, environment, that's uh, Microsoft using their Hotmail, rebadged and kept secure in our Southern Ireland, so it meets the European uh, directives. But the procurement, of all of these is really, really important. It's becoming absolutely critical that you understand how to go about um, identifying suitable vendors, identifying suitable requirement specifications so you can choose the right packages. And then the final one is the client interface. How do we design that interface in 
our apps, on the web, so that the people who are using our apps, who are whether on the web or in uh, smart devices, all in terms of mainframe type systems for banking and all these other things that run internally, like Blackboard, like course resources, the user interface, the client interface is really, really important and working with clients, so you're in business and you're trying to get the right relationship if you're selling software, selling services to some clients, again, these sort of skills are covered there. Now to have a look at the definitions of these seven skills. So about the only bit of initiative that's expected in the follower is that they need to be able to, be, to organize themselves. Told what to do, when to do it, they get a work schedule and then they have to just work through it, basically. I trust that all of you will be better than this. That's why you're grad going to become graduates. This is why you are undergraduates, because you've got the skills to be better than just a follower under close supervision. As you go out in a year and a half's time to your placement, you're going to find, by and large, you're going to be interacting with a lot of people. There's one I went out to a couple of weeks ago, second, just finished his second year, and he's now taking the lead for projects. He's actually working with clients, the customers, and leading on the project. So he's even got better than this. You should at least be able to do this. Assist using discretion, wider circle interaction, and have a speciality. And look at this bottom set part of the sentence. Proactively manages your personal development. That means you use this framework to identify where you're great or adequate or lacking and identif help identify the things you need to do to improve. It might be you need to go to one of our lecturers here in the university or to your supervisor <coughs> out in your job or you understand how to go find the information to solve a problem. All those technical blogs and technical websites which we all keep encouraging you to go to to help develop your expertise, to find the answer. <coughs> so that's undergraduate I was talking about, who I went to see a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, completing his own milestone and reviews, discretion to escalate his problems, working directly with suppliers and customers, even has some supervisory responsibility. So this would be a typical business analyst sort of level. Handle the schedule. So a senior business analyst level, using that sort of pun, or a group leader. And, you know, we expect you, all of you to get to pretty much at least level four capability in quite a range of those tasks that you're going to um, develop the technical skills for over the next three years. <coughs> now we begin to move up the supervisory level of an organisation. Self-sufficient in business skills. Also say self-sufficient in many of the technical skills. Becoming expert. And if you think about what you'll be achieving in your final year when you do your independent studies project, you are going to be developing many of these level, five, level four and level five skills. So you, they will become the evidence that you are capable of achieving that sort of thing. Because as you do your project, you will bump into unpredicted things happening. 
it will be quite challenging by design to help you to really stretch yourself and deliver that evidence. Level six is going to become the sort of stuff you pick up and get to as you do a mid-career uh, master's degree, for example. But middle management will be about this level. You will be helping to develop policy. The work that you're doing is going to identify significant areas where there are issues that need to be solved. You will be initiating and leading both technical and business change. And then right at the very top, setting policy. But certainly, I mean, in all of your programs that you're studying, you should understand some of the level seven types of questions, issues. So, those are the skill levels, you might say. I'm showing you here the breakdown of those six categories. Here is a strategy and architecture section looking for th at developing your technical skills in areas like information strategy. Where should we be going over the next five to ten years to gain really strong, sustainable business advantage. Now, whether you are in computer science or whether you're in BSEIT or any of the other programs, you need to understand how the longer term picture of the capabilities of technology, of information, are going to affect the business opportunities that will allow your company to continue to thrive and prosper. You need to understand how the business strategy is related to the information technology strategy. And there's a book in the library that you may find really interesting after you've got past the first four chapters that are rather difficult. A book called From Control to Drift by Claudio Shibora and a few colleagues. Chapter three is interesting because that's where he develops the idea of, from control, the idea that businesses need to be in control, or directors need to be in control of where the company's going and how it's doing that, how it's achieving its strategy. But it also points out that there are problems with doing this, because there's a real world underneath which you can't always change as quickly as you need to, because you can't afford to, the technology may not be there that supports you, or your technology that you have actually blocks what you want to do. And then, out of this, their diagram shows, you end up with more problem areas, so you go back round, I've got more challenges, I need to get more control, go through the strategy setting, bumps into reality, more problems, and so, as they put it, the desire for greater control, the pursuit of greater control, ultimately, if you're not careful, leads to less and less effective change and development. And the final bit is the technical strategy and planning that kind of supports all of this. And those are the four skill areas uh, that kind of, well, three major skill areas plus advice and guidance that are really important there in the strategy and architecture. You will get opportunities to develop various areas of these over your next three years. Most of your programs that you, have that you guys here are studying probably won't get you much experience in this set of skills. Other than BSEIT, where there will be some as uh, aspects on this, because that's really fundamental to BSEIT. Less important in computer, computer science, um, computer games programming, networks and security and forensic investigation, not so important uh, in terms of our degree. Because those degrees are much more technically orientated. Here, however, this one 
you're all involved in these. CGP, you know, the human factors, how humans behave when they're playing games, are absolutely critical in designing your games. If you don't understand how people behave, you won't design games which people really enjoy. Then you won't sell many games, and your company will not be very successful. Installation, uh, integration, and so on. Computer science, network security, <coughs> IT, CGP, and even forensics investigation are going to need to understand many of these areas from different perspectives. If you're doing forensics investigation, for example, if you don't understand how this lot works, you won't understand how you need to go and collect the evidence that help you to work out whether fraud is being undertaken or who's doing the fraud. Differently, if you're doing BSCIT, well, you need to understand this, otherwise you won't have a clue how to properly develop, implement, and then maintain and support the system. These are, and if you're in computer science, networks and security, again, these concepts affect the success of what you're trying to achieve. And then the procurement and management side, these four, quality. All of you need to understand what we mean by the term quality in terms of the overall technology and the broader systems which take you from the beginning of a problem, this is what we want to achieve, there may be lots of working practices, workflows and so on, plus people, and somewhere in the middle of it, hopefully it's facilitating IT that helps the whole thing to go and actually achieve its objectives. The problem is we aren't terribly good on the quality side. Why else are we in a perpetual state of beta development of almost all of the apps on our smart devices? Because we've got to get it out there quickly, and we'll fix it perhaps next time something comes up, or in three weeks' time, or four weeks' time, or whenever. How many of those apps that you've downloaded over the last, say, six months haven't really worked terribly well and have had a download in the App Store that you use pretty much every month? I've got on here, somewhere I think it is, I think I've got an update for every single app on here. Let's see if I can find out. It says it can't, can't actually attach. Oh, here we are. The 22 apps have got updates. That's almost every single one that's on there. And they come every month, is it, folks? Or is it every two months you get an app update? Does that show evidence of decent quality? How many of those updates that we get regularly are because of security flaws? Because people didn't design security in from the very beginning. It's a, oops, dear, we forgot that bit. And we need to try and engineer security back into a product which didn't have security for, by design. And then there's other ones. This one, we, you will, in team projects, you will get experience of sort of client support, client inter interfaces and interaction. So the real point about all of that is, first of all, you need to go <coughs> to Sophia. You need to register and then start using both the CPD functionality there, that you go online, you do your skills audit, you do your capability or self audit, and then build a plan for developing yourself over the next three, four years while you're here, 
and then continue to use it. Oi, I'm not finished yet. I've just come to the end of the slide. I've not finished talking, so don't get ready to go. And then you start actively using the CPD functionality in Sophia that you will then get access to to start taking ownership of your career, your curriculum that you're developing, deciding, because you're in the first year, but end of your first semester, you can start thinking about, well, if, I, if these are the things I need to do, but I don't like this, 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 and this, you actually have the opportunity to think about changing programs. Just because you're signed up to do computer science doesn't mean to say you're locked into doing that for the rest of your life. You can decide to change pretty quickly. You have those opportunities. So Sophia gives you the evidence and the ideas to help you work out whether you really want to do nets and security or forensic investigation or uh, computer science or CGP or BSCIT. You can change programs and you can use this to help you to work out what you want to do. Go and have a look online at all of the job adverts for different types of jobs in your discipline and those other four disciplines. See, look at those which actually refer to the SOFIA framework in terms of the job accountabilities and responsibilities and the skills requirements. See how that helps you to decide what you want to do where you want to go, and then plan your future. Because today, unlike when I started 40 odd years ago, you know, I went to Rolls Royce and I knew I'd be at Rolls Royce for the rest of my life. That's what happened back then. Today, that doesn't happen anything like as much. I didn't need to worry about developing my career because there was a career development wing of uh, HR now called, who would look after you and put you in the right jobs every two or three years. Today, that really doesn't happen any longer. The model has changed that you become accountable for your career development. If you want to change jobs, you have to go and look for it. You have to sell yourself to those other jobs that you really want. I never had to. Every 18 months, someone will come and say, Richard, I think you'd be, we want you in this job or that job or the other job. So almost the whole of my career to the beginning of the 1990s, it just happened for me. That ain't going to happen for you guys at all. You need to use something like Sophia to take ownership of the, your career, of your career de development, Many of the times, if you want a salary rise, you will have to look for a new job. Because you won't be getting much, in, particularly in SMEs, you probably will not be getting many promotions internally. So you need to use Sophia for yourself. It's one of the best frameworks there is to help you to do this job. Okay, folks, I expect next week to see you all signed up for Sophia and starting to make progress with your CPD elements. Thank you.